All right, welcome back. This is session two. And when we left off, we were talking about some of the missionaries in the Bible. And right now, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to you about one last missionary from the Bible. And probably the most important missionary that there is in the Bible. But yet a lot of times this, this guy is not con really even considered a missionary. And it's Jesus himself. And a lot of times people think, well, Jesus really wasn't a missionary. But he was. He was sent out by the Father to go to a foreign land. He left heaven to come down to earth here with us. And he carried the good, the good news of God's love everywhere he went throughout his whole life. So really he's fulfilling that role as a missionary. Now while he was in his hometown of Nazareth, Jesus was in the synagogue one day and he was handed a scroll and he read this scroll. And what this scroll did, he proclaimed his mission here on earth. And this comes from Luke, and it's chapter 4, verse 18 and 19. And it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim that captives will be released, that the blind will see, that the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come. So Jesus set the standard right there for each and every one of us as a missionary. He, had, he loved the Father. He loved his fellow man. Everywhere he went, he carried the good news with him. And God sent him out. He sent him out just like he sends you and I out. You know, it's really simple. As a missionary, we never, we never get someone saved. You know, oftentimes I hear people say that. Oh, I, I, got, I got this person saved. All we do is we bring the good news. We share the gospel with people. And then we step back and we let the Holy Spirit do the rest. That's, that's our only job. Deliver that good news. We are that vessel. Now at this time I'd like to, I'd like to go through a little bit of, of teaching for, from a pastor that, that I really look up to. His name is uh, Larry Stockstill and he's from Highlands University. And he did a teaching called the Mandate of Missions. And I, I want to share that with you guys. So let me start off by saying, you know, God wants to bless you when you're out there in the mission field. And he does. He bless your life when you go out where he has sent you. So we're going to start off with some scripture. It's 1 Timothy 1.15 and it says, This is a truthful saying and everyone should accept it. Now I'll tell you right now, anytime you hear something like that in the Bible, you better be prepared because what they're going to give you next is, is super important. So this is a truthful saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You know, what a powerful, powerful scripture there is. Jesus Christ came into this world to save sinners. Now, as a church, we've kind of lost the focus of this particular verse right here. You know, in our modern day churches right now, we're more concerned with what color the carpet is or whether we're going to have chairs or pews or do we have enough stained glass or do we not have enough stained glass or, you know, what kind of lawnmower are we going to have to cut the church grass? Are we going to get a zero turn or a little riding tractor? We've lost that focus. Jesus doesn't care about any of that stuff. Jesus came to earth to save sinners. And that's what we've got to make our focus be. We've got to redirect ourselves back to that good news. Now, there are 8 billion people on this planet. 8 billion. That's with a B. 8 billion people. My mind, it can't even grasp that kind of number. So I did a little research, and I found out that if you take pennies, and you stack 8 billion pennies on top of each other, it would form a tower, and this tower would be 6,960 miles high. That's what the number of 8 billion looks like. If you took that same tower and laid it on its side, it would cross the United States three times. Now, of those eight billion people, five and a half billion, there again, with a B, five and a half billion, 69% of that population are not saved. 69% of the world's population is not saved today. Of that five and a half billion, half of those have never, ever heard the name of Jesus. Matter of fact, if you go to China, 
and you ask someone, hey, do you know Jesus? They'll say, well, what is that? They think, it, they think it's a thing. They don't realize it's a person. So yet 69% of our population right now is on a journey that's going to face eternity without God in it. So right now, I hope that, that this is kind of starting to stir something inside of you, starting to, to maybe bring up a feeling of urgency within your life. I mean, do you, do you see the urgency here when there's five and a half billion people that are unsaved on this planet? Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, he, he commissioned us to go out and be witnesses. You know, that great commission is not fulfilled yet. You know, many times in America we think, well, everybody's heard about Jesus. Everybody, everybody knows about him. That great commission is nowhere near filled. 69% of the population is not saved out there. There's still tons of work to be done. Do you feel that urgency? We've lost our mandate to save sinners. We still have a conviction to help save sinners. So now what I want to do, I want to share with you the difference between a conviction and a mandate. You know, we have a conviction that Jesus was born of a virgin. We have a conviction that Jesus died and rose from the grave. We have a conviction that Jesus is the Son of God. You know, if someone came up to me and said one of those things weren't true, you know, I would stand up and I would defend it. And I, and I, would, I would stand up and defend that to death. That's a conviction. You know, a conviction is something that you will die to defend. A mandate is something that you will die to achieve. And when there's five and a half billion people out there in the world that right now don't know the truth, we've got to do something to get them on that arc of salvation. There's a tidal wave of judgment that is coming our way. And one day we'll stand before God. And each and every one of us will be judged. You know, now why did Noah, why did Noah build the ark? You know, I, and I, I've thought of this myself. Why did he build it other than that he was told to do it? Well, experts tell us that it took him 120 years to build that ark. Can you imagine working on one project for 120 years? You know, he had no power tools, no crane, no heavy equipment, no subcontractors to come in and, and take care of the interior while he did the exterior. No. Why do you think he worked so hard to build that ark? Well, I'll tell you why. Because he had a wife. And he had three sons. And he had three daughter-in-laws. And if he didn't get that ark built, they weren't going to be able to be on it. They weren't going to be saved when that great flood came. He had a mandate to save his family there. He was willing to die to achieve building that ark. He was willing to die to get that done. And that's the same kind of commitment that we need to get back into our souls right now. We need to get a spirit of mandate back into our lives. You know, Jesus said, I must be about my father's business. Now, he didn't say, well, I might be out there about my father's business. Or he didn't say, well, it's probably a good idea if I go be about my father's business. Or maybe I should do my father's business. I don't know. No, he said that he must be about his father's business. Anytime you have a must, that's a mandate. That's something that you are willing to die to get accomplished. Now, I know I'm repeating myself on a lot of this stuff. You're hearing the same thing over and over again. But I want you to grab a hold of the seriousness and the urgency of what I'm telling you here. Now, I'd like to share a story with you that I heard about a man. This gentleman was in his home one night. And he's asleep. And he's woken up by a strange noise. He hears a very strange noise. And he sits up in his bed and he tries to figure out what is that noise. And then he realizes it's a smoke detector. So he reaches over and he wakes his wife up and tells her to get out of the house. And then he goes room to room getting his kids and taking them, getting them out of the house. And when he gets to his youngest daughter, a four-year-old, she didn't want to leave. He had to drag her out of the house. She didn't want to leave her room. So he gets outside and he looks around and he realizes that his six-year-old son is missing. His six-year-old son is still in that house. Now by this time... The flames have grown bigger, and this whole house is engulfed in flames. But he heads back inside to find his son. And he gets to his son's room. 
And he, he looks in there and he doesn't see him. Then he opens the closet door and his son is in, is in the closet. And he's singing. He's singing praises to the Lord because he's scared. And that's what, that's what he knew to do. Well, the dad grabs him up and he starts out with him. But by this time, the flames are intense. And the heat is so intense. It's so much in there that the father's contacts actually melted to his eyeballs. He gets out and he takes his son out. And then as soon as he gets outside, he collapses on the lawn. That dad had a mandate to save his kids. He was going to do whatever he had to do. He was willing to die to achieve the rescue of his son. So when it's your child, it changes your conviction to a mandate. Now was it a conviction when Noah started to build that ark when it was his family? No, it was a mandate for him. When that 5.5 million, or excuse me, 5.5 billion people start becoming names and faces and families and children, it becomes a mandate for us. It should be stirring something inside of us. It should start stirring a fire inside of us. It changes our conviction to a mandate for lost souls at that point. Now in that fire, that dad didn't just look around and go, ah, we got four out of five of them out. That's pretty good. No, he was going back in that fire. He was going to save his child. And we've got to have that kind of mandate in our lives for lost people. Five and a half billion people. Now, there's a false doctrine going around out there that I want to dismiss right now. And I want to I make it clear right now. This is not Heartland's doctrine at all. This is a false doctrine that's being taught out there. And this doctrine, uh, kind of their, I guess you would say their mission statement is unreached people are saved by their ignorance. So what that's saying is that if someone's never heard about the, about the Lord, that they're automatically saved. That's not true. That is a lie right there. I've often wondered myself, well, you know, how does that work if someone's never heard, never heard the gospel? Surely, you know, deep down in the Amazon, this tribe that's never heard, heard of God, how can they... How can they be held accountable? How can they go to hell? But you know, the scripture tells us that Jesus, that through Jesus is the only way into heaven. It doesn't say if you never heard, you're good to go. You know, hey, if that was the case, everybody just run around and be, be ignorant of the facts all the time. No, the Bible is very clear. It says Jesus is the only way to heaven. These other religions, they're telling you there are other ways you can get into heaven, other things you can do. They're a lie. They're a total lie. So now scripture tells us, it's in Romans 10, 14, and 15, about how these people are to get into heaven. So once again, it's Romans 10, 14 through 15. How can they call on him to save themselves unless they believe in him? How can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scriptures say, How beautiful are the feet of the messenger who brings the good news. Now why do you think I'm teaching this class tonight? You think it's because I'm such an eloquent speaker? Obviously not. You know, you think maybe I had nothing else to do tonight, you know, so I'll just come hang out here. No, that's not the case at all. It's because of this calling, this mandate for us to go out and share that good news. Share that good news with five and a half billion people. That responsibility falls on us. It falls on the ones that have, that have heard the good news. It falls on us to go out and share it with them. Do you kind of see where I'm driving this bus here? You know, they can't call on him if we don't go out. And we can't go out unless we take that first step. You know, God has placed a calling on each and every one of our lives. And if we don't, if we don't step out into that calling, we failed. You know, he's given us a mandate to go back into that burning house and grab up and try to rescue our brothers and sisters from that fire. You know, what are you going to do? 
Now I'm sharing a vision with each of you right now. This vision of world missions. Can you see yourself going to the ends of the earth? Or maybe at least to the ends of your town? Five and a half billion people. At this time I'd like to pray. I want to share a, a prayer with you right now. You know, and if you're feeling like maybe maybe you do, you do need to step out. You want to step out. Maybe you want to help save sinners in Mexico or Africa or Belize or India, or Peru, Uganda, to the ends of the earth. Maybe just in your hometown. I want to pray for you right now. Lord, I just ask that you place a spirit upon us that we can no longer ignore this calling. Lord, move in us, stir in us. Lord, I ask that you, you bless that stirring inside of us. You stir us to move. And Lord, I ask that, that you give us the finances and the ability to move your kingdom forward. Lord, I ask your blessings upon Church of the Heartland that we raise up masses to go out into the field and to harvest. Lord, your scriptures tell us that the workers are few. Lord, we just ask right now that you bless Heartland that we raise up masses to go out into those fields. And Lord, we ask for those provisions. Those provisions so that this mandate can be carried out, Lord. And when we're talking about provisions, we're talking about everything from finances to connections, Lord. Whatever it takes. Lord, we ask that you open doors. You give us new connections, new contacts, new opportunities in our lives. And Lord, I ask that you help us to plant churches where right this moment, right now, there's no church, Lord. I ask that you help us to plant churches there. And it's in your son Jesus' holy and precious name, I pray. Amen. Now, this time, what I'd like to do, I'd like to share some stories of some of your, your heartland missionaries, some of the people from your very congregations that have gone out and, and done mission work and touched lives. And the first one uh, is from right here in the Plymouth campus. It's Trinity Robinson. And I'm just going to read what Trinity sent to me. My name is Trinity, and I went on a mission trip to Belize in 2018. I love to travel. I love to talk about Jesus to people. So it was a no-brainer when I heard about the trip. And what stood out to me on that trip was the girls' home we visited. They take in young girls that were rescued from sex trafficking. It broke my heart to hear their different stories. But at the same time, my heart grew ten times bigger. Trinity was being filled up with the Holy Spirit right there, and that is awesome. When I first walked into the house... I saw a glowing light radiating from each girl. And the Holy Spirit just showed me that these girls felt tainted and broken. A feeling similar to what I felt when I was abused. But Jesus came to restore. I had the opportunity to share my testimony with these girls and to pray with each of them. I didn't think my story was worth much compared to theirs. But God definitely used the team that year to speak into lives and to set people free. I was so blessed to be part of what God had done. You know, right there, sharing your testimony is so, so powerful. You know, the enemy wants us to think that we're the only one. And when we share our testimony, I said it earlier, your testimony will touch more lives than sitting there and reading scripture to someone all day long. Because then they're able to identify and they realize, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that feels this way. I'm not the only one that has this addiction. I'm not the only one that, that does these things. I'm not the only one that falls down and fails here. And then they're able to relate. And, it's the, and then people are able to see, hey, there is hope for me. Thank you, Trinity, for sending that in. The next story I'd like to share with you tonight comes from Pastor Jim Howard. He's the campus pastor at Church of the Heartland in Rochester. And Pastor Jim writes, The Lord spoke to me to be in Ukraine on January 1st. I had no idea why, 
because I had no connections there at all. So I approached Pastor Herb to see if he wanted to go with me because he had been there before. And I also asked Todd Gibson if he would like to also go, and he agreed. A few weeks before we left, Pastor Herb told me he wouldn't be able to go with me. I started to get a little nervous because, again, I had no connection there, and that was all. Well, while waiting for the time to leave, I asked God what I was supposed to speak about while I was there, but I got no answer. I was really starting to get nervous now. Here I was going to a country that I'd never been to before, did not have any contacts there at all. I didn't understand why God, why on earth God was sending me there. At this time, I was doubting if I truly even heard from God or not. Well, I met someone who knew someone in Kiev, and they set me up with this contact. But I still didn't have anything in the way of a sermon for these people he was sending me out to. So the day before I boarded a plane to head to Ukraine, God spoke to me and said, All I want you to do is share your testimony. Okay, well, now I have some peace about what I was going to do and what I was going to bring to these people. But it was still pretty unsettling that I was going to a country with only one contact. But I was starting to get peace that God was in control of this whole trip. Well, we landed and we met our contact. And he was, he was a well-known pastor in this area. It was a bit different, to say the least. He didn't know us and we didn't know him. But through the day, we got to know each other a little better. And he told me that he had a radio station and that I was going to speak that night. Then it happened. He asked me what I was going to preach about. And I told him I wasn't. And he looked at me and said, what? And I said, I'm not going to preach. The Lord told me to just share my testimony on this trip. Well, he looked at me pretty disgusted and said, oh, this is going to be good. So we get to the station and went on the air and he introduced me and he said, go ahead and share your testimony. So I did. And when I finished, the phone line started to light up and it didn't stop until we left that night, later that night. It was truly amazing. The rest of the trip was the same. Everywhere we went, it was the same. I would share and people would fill the altar to repent and to be set free. Never did I veer away from what God told me to do. We met so many wonderful people and so many people's lives were touched by the power of God. If I can encourage you, just be obedient to the urgings of the Holy Spirit. When he calls you, he will give you the words to say and take you to the people you need, that need to hear what you have to say. Well, thank you, Pastor Jim, for, for sharing that message. You know, Jim was faithful right there. He listened to what the Holy Spirit said to him. He knew what he needed to do, and he didn't veer from it. So when you feel those urges from the Holy Spirit, maybe they're telling you, you need to go on this mission trip or... Maybe you need to speak to that person. A mission trip doesn't necessarily have to be out of the country. It can be within the United States. It can be right there in your own grocery store. We have a commission to share the good news with that 5.5 with that billion people out there. So right now, if I can say one thing to you, I urge you, let that stirring inside of you grow. And if you feel that calling for the mission field, make a move on it. With that, I'd like to go ahead and close this in prayer. This will wind up session two. Lord, I just thank you for everyone here tonight, live, and also, Lord, everyone online that's watching. Lord, I just ask that this message sink into our hearts, Lord, and those, those five and a half billion people that don't know you, 69% of the population that has never never had an opportunity to to accept you Lord I can't imagine a life without the the promise of eternity in heaven with you Lord I just ask that you you build a fire inside of us 
And you move us, Lord, to have a heart for these lost people. And it's in your son Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys, and we'll see you next week.